<laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. I think I put a cloudy icon there, a cloudy uh, emoji first. It's actually quite bright today. The camera's quite bright on the front of the... Uh, the sun's quite bright on the front of the shop here. Good morning, good morning. Okay, Saturday in a sucks. It's going to be busy. Outside is already busy. I don't know why. Something's going on this weekend up here, maybe. I don't know. It seems to be a bit busier than normal. There could be races, horse races on. Not quite sure. I don't know, last weekend there was, and we had, I don't know, there's sort of three or four different crowds now happen here in Asakusa. There's the traditional crowd, the horse racing guys, the guys my age, old guys, they're retired, whatever. <coughs> they come for the horse racing on the weekends. They're mostly on the west of here, west and north. And then there's now families come around, they look for activities to do in Asakusa on the weekend. Then there's the young people for drinking, Hopi Dori. Then there's the type two young girls. They traipse around holding hands. They've got their kimono. That's another common type here. And not on the weekends, but if it's a weekday in the evenings, the salary month. They come out of their company. They head to a saksa for a drink before going home. So there's all these different groups of people that are attracted to a saksa. And one is missing, of course, right now. The, the other group that was really, really big here a few years ago is the foreign tourists. And they're still pretty thin on the ground. So we've got all these different kinds of people that hang out in this neighborhood. It's really kind of interesting. People of Asakusa, as time goes by, it's changed. Even in the seven, eight years that I've been here now, it's really changed dramatically. Here's, well, not the vegetable man, this is the Oriental, what does it say? Oriental Bakery. I can't see, it's too small, just a sec. Yes, Oriental Bakery. Where is he going? He's delivering bread to the coffee shop across the street, I guess. We can't see where he's going. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, there's the coffee shop right next to the guy with the, the blue the blue whale. Okay, paper is out. Just one person today, Ishikawa-san. She's doing some back numbers of the Yokai series, the Yokai face-off. She's finished her batch of prints for June. The July blocks aren't ready yet. They'll be ready in a few days. So in between, she's doing other work. She's doing a batch of yokai prints. Someone's asking, how's the whale business? I don't know. He seems to be okay. There are lineups on the weekends. There's no lineups during the week, same as any restaurant around here. No idea. Okay, let's get busy. Let's get busy. Oh, this just arrived. They arrived last night from... <laughs> From Chiharasa. You've seen this before. This is not a new print. This is a reprinting of a previous edition. You've seen this one. This is the first print in the Woodblock Pilgrimage series. These are back from Chiharu Kanai. Kawai. Kawai Chiharu. And it's a killer. This is one of the best ones we've ever made, you know. Absolutely. Jed San did, did, did himself proud, and we have done a really, really strong job with the making of this. There's something I could mention. She struggled a little bit with this one because the sizing was a bit too hard. This was one of the first ones that Aoyama-san did the sizing for when I was over in Canada. And he struggled a little bit. And then Chiaru-san also struggled a little bit. And Hontoni, the sizing here, was a little bit too strong. And on the back here, you see this speckled pattern? This is an indication that there was too much glue in the paper. There was too much Nikawa. And she's come through. She's done it really nicely. Even with that too much glue, this, this color is still smooth. You can see a few places down here. See this sort of little bit speckled pattern. If this had been a kimono or something, we'd have been in trouble because it would look funny. But on a building like this, this just looks natural. But that's come from there being too much glue in the paper. So she must have uh, she must have said a few things at the beginning there. But this is well within the parameters of what I would like to make. No problem at all. 
that looks natural. And where it needed to be dead smooth in the sky, she struggled with it. Well, she, she poured on the technique and she did it properly. So. Look at this. A machine. The lady is a printmaking machine. Cut corners. I don't see any cut corners. <laughs> What's this? She's got a note. She has. She didn't cut the corners. She's got three at the back. She's mentioned yare. Something is wrong with them. Well, this is one of her first tests, of course. So, look at this. You can see the difference in color. So, these will be maybe her first three sheets. Yeah, you can see the color's not matching. Very happy to have people like this working for us. Very, very, very happy. So this afternoon, I gotta check these, send her the count, pay. The mother son will pay her for them, and they'll go to Oma. Okay, 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 okay. Moving that out of the way, this, I didn't have a time to eat this this morning. It's supposed to be my breakfast. This is uh, Lawson. Here, today's stream brought to you by. We can read it. Anybody there can read this? Buran no donuts. It's a brand donut. It's from the Lawson. Uh, the Lawson department store, a uh, Lawson convenience store, and they've got a, what they call a natural Lawson brand. And actually, this almost, <laughs> I, I don't want to exaggerate, this got me arrested yesterday, almost got me arrested. I, on the way back from the pool, I stopped at the Lawson around the corner. Today's Saturday, I didn't go today, so on the but way back from the pool yesterday, I stopped at the Lawson to get a cup of coffee and a brand donut for a little, quote, half breakfast, half snack after the pool. I can't eat before going to the pool because you can't swim with, with a bunch of stuff in your guts. And I don't know, I'm getting older something or what, I don't know. I, I got my, my plastic bag with my towel and all that stuff in it. I go to the Lawson and I get two of the donuts, hold them in my hand, take them to the counter and it's a regular clerk. And he knows what I'm gonna do. He knows I'm gonna ask for a coffee. So he turns around to get the coffee. And while he's turning around to get the coffee cup, I put the two donuts in my plastic bag, you know, ready to go home. He turns around with the cup, puts the cup on the counter, picks up his barcode reader. There's nothing on the counter. He looks up at me. I look at him, and I'm like, you know, why are you looking at me? And he says, "Ano donuts," and I've put them in my bag. <laughs> So, but luckily, this is a regular guy. He and I, it's like almost every day he's here. So I pull him out, embarrassed, he beeps them, looks at me again, we put him back in my bag, and he beeps the coffee, and away we go. But if it hadn't been one of the regular clerks, someone who didn't know me, one of those red paintballs on my back, I don't know. I just did what I normally do. I get there, I put the donut on the counter, get the coffee, pay for it, put the donut in my bag, you know. I don't know, I'm 70, am I losing it? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Crap. Crap. Okay, let's get busy carving. More stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Okay, this, uh, no, let's talk about this later. There's an envelope here. We can maybe talk about this at show and tell time. We have a, an envelope here, and it's full of maybe 20 or 30 match label prints s scavenged from auction. So when we get to show and tell time, let's decide what to do. We can open and look at the new match label prints, or we can get back to our black folder.
okay, let's get going here. We might, I don't think we finished today, but a couple more days we should finish this. You know, actually, this is quite easy. But I can't see what's going on in the boat here, so I need a sample. So I grabbed my album, my Sudimono album. This is my, my album, my casual use, the Sudimono album set that I made over the five years, 1999, over five years. I just keep reference copies here as a sample. And I need one of them here today. Let's get this boat. This is where we're going today. This is the original size, and today we have really shrunk it down to a small size. So we're not going to have all the lines matching one for one for one. Absolutely. We're simplifying it. So in the middle here, I've got to just make up something as we go along and simplify it. We'll see. Let's get the sails finished first. And also, we have a little bonus today. I'll, I'll need to be reminded about this. Let's look at this part way along. I've got to do some work first, but if you remind me, say, halfway along or whatever, I have a couple of small movie clips to show you. And I think they are things that even long-term fans here have perhaps never seen. Uh, we had yesterday in Tokyo, those people in the staff here who are using smartphones and stuff, they got an alert yesterday. And it wasn't the typical earthquake on the way alert. We get those sort of all the time. You're on the train and everybody's smartphone suddenly will jump and ring because there's been an alert from the uh, meteorological agency that an earthquake has been detected and that PS waves are on the way to Tokyo or stuff like that. Yesterday there was a similar thing, but it wasn't an earthquake alert. It was a tornado alert. We had one of those in Tokyo yesterday. I don't know if it actually became a tornado anywhere, but there were some very, very strong, very brisk winds came past our area. And the winds came down the street and every parked bicycle, every bicycle got knocked over and a bunch of the signs from the restaurants got knocked over. And for a few minutes it was kind of chaos. And then everybody went out and cleaned up the mess and uh, things went on as normal. So I, don't, I didn't see any tornado, but there was a high wind. So anyway, so this alert came into everybody's phones, including the two girls that were here yesterday, Ayano-san and Watanabe-san. So that got us talking about different stuff, different weather, whatever, and they were saying, you know, they're happy to be here in Asakusa, which is such a nice, safe place, you know. And I'm like, nice, safe place here, Asakusa? And they said, well, you know, what could go wrong? You know, I forget the exact words of the conversation. So I had some video to show them, and I might as well show it to you guys too. When I when I showed it to them yesterday, I realized. So if you remind me, jog me it around, you know, somewhere along in the stream today. I've got a couple of short video clips of an Asakusa disaster. Little tiny movie clips that I took myself a few years ago. This knife is still wicked sharp, you know. When did I sharpen this now? A couple of days ago, and I haven't used it much since then. Um, but it is wicked sharp. I'm still, I don't know, worried that I'm going to break it here.
I'm not sure if you can hear it, it's a bit of noise in the background, but uh, we got a notification yesterday. You know, the usual thing, when neighbors and stuff are doing something that's going to make a lot of noise, they have to come around and uh, apologize for it in advance, and they give you the schedule, and here's the construction that'll be happening over the next little while. And we got one of these yesterday. A guy came around in his, uh, in his uh, you know, worker's uniform and passed me a sheet and did the usual apology. He passes a pack of tissues and a sheet and said, here's the schedule. And we're going to be drilling, boring for the new foundation for the new building that they're building next to us. You know, a few months ago we had noise when there was a building being torn down. <clears throat> and now the other part of it has begun. They're going to be putting a new building up. And they're going to go apparently quite deep, so they're going to be boring a new foundation or, you know, putting in pilings or whatever they're called, I don't know. And that's going to get pretty horrifically noisy. And they may interfere with some of our streams because they're going to start at 8 o'clock every day and they're going to probably run seven days a week till they get it done. So we'll see. This is the building. You can't see it from the front. It's the back street, but it's the building that comes up behind us against the next building. So we're sort of kitty corner to it. A Chinese real estate company has bought the land and they're putting in some kind of investment building. I don't know what they're doing. We have no idea what kind of thing will be in the building when it's finished. But it's an, an investment company, overseas investment company has, has bought the property. So is that Japanese buildings in a tornado? I don't know. I know the modern concrete buildings, no big deal. A little Japanese house hit by a tornado would of course come apart, I guess, completely. <clears throat> For the most part, the traditional Japanese construction is post and beam, and the heavy roof sits on top of posts and beams. So I would imagine if a tornado wind got underneath that, boom, up you go, I guess. I don't know. It was windy for a couple minutes there. It was a little bit scary. I guess that's a person, I'm not sure. This thing at the front, that's clearly a person here. And it's a very, very, uh, I don't know, I think it's a person to show. And this one at the back, is this supposed to be a person as well? I wouldn't have guessed so if I just saw this by itself. But after seeing the rough shape here that's supposed to define a person, I think two legs and a, and a, a top, I think this also is supposed to be a person. I mean, it, at this scale, it doesn't matter. It's just a shape. It's something huddled in the back of the boat here. Well, as long as I think, keep something in mind that it should somehow look like a person huddled back there.
Now, the bottom edge of this sail in the original, it's sort of split into one, two, but roughly. So let's try and do the same thing. There's a bit of mess up at the front. tend to overdo these you know thinking I got the microscope here we can do this but you know I think it's okay, you know. It's just ropes and spars rolled together. It doesn't matter what it looks like, so.
<laughs> what do we got? Deliveries happening here next door? That's the oyster restaurant next door. Is somebody making a delivery? Oh yeah. Lots of activity out there today. Seafood delivery, yeah, well it's oysters next door. They get the package of uh, you know styrofoam boxes. They don't do fish there, they do uh, oysters. I think they do lobsters, I'm not quite sure. I've never actually eaten there. But I think all the restaurants around here are going to be anticipating a very, very busy day today. It's a nice day, it's sunny for the most part, but tomorrow is forecast to be heavy rain. So people that are thinking of, you know, weekend stuff are going to be getting out and doing it today. So I think this joint is going to be jumping for the most part today. It's going to be a busy day in the Saxa. Is that supposed to be a person as well? I don't think so. I don't really know. It's hard to tell. I don't think I need to overthink it. Just simply copy the kind of shape I see there. I don't think it's... I uh, don't think it's critical. <laughs> it's a seal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I doubt they've got a seal sitting at the front of their boat. <coughs> <coughs> I think it's a person. You can imagine a person sitting there with their legs hanging down. I don't know. Again, that, that's one size. By the time we shrink it to the size we've got here, I don't really think it makes much difference. I'm just going to try and make shapes that look something similar. You know? And it's all going to be a gloomy, dark color anyway. So. might be more important is to get those curves like in here which lines connect to which ones and clearly the important line here is going to be this one this is the front of the boat you know these two lines here so it doesn't much matter what we do with these lumps but if this line didn't join up then it wouldn't make any sense so so let's get the important lines cut this one goes straight through
Do we need the outside mic turned off? Let me know if it's too noisy out there. <coughs> the outside mic has its own control. I can turn the outside mic down and I can also close the door if there's too much noise from outside there. Let's turn it down, let's turn it down. <laughs> hmm, I like to, I like having an ambient sound from out there, but if it's dentist work, I don't think we need it, so. It never stops, you know, as soon as one company is finished, somebody else starts up somewhere else. And we, we're part of it now and then. We've done our own construction jobs here, of course. So we, we too, we've been part of it. But, uh, This thing is split in two. This has two, it's got a hole in the middle there, split. <coughs> but at this scale now, there's no way. If I try to put a split in there, it'll just make it too weak. But we can texture this. The rule for those construction noises is 8 to 8. Uh, they're not supposed to start before 8 in the morning, and they're not supposed to continue past 8 at night. And us too, when we're doing our own construction, anything that could uh, cause noise outside, 8 to 8 is your typical window. There are sometimes jobs that need to be done. They'll dig up a gas or a water main in the street, and they'll do that sometimes at night so that it doesn't disturb traffic. So uh, uh, city-wide jobs and stuff like that can happen during the night. But private, private stuff, building a building or doing your own maintenance, whatever, are, are not supposed to happen outside that window. Eight to eight is the time frame normally. You're talking oysters. I don't know what's the price next door here. I really don't know. I can go out and look at the look at the menu. I think their menu is probably online. If you. Uh, if you want to see the menu for the place next door, whatever, just here's the place to Google. Asaksa Kaki Goya. That's the name of the shop next door. actually that's going to get tiresome because it's going to be a, a more than a year <coughs> more than a year to put that thing up and this is going to go on endlessly we 
I've been lucky. That building was abandoned for all the time that I've been here in the sucks. I'm just quietly sitting there mouldering away. And now, up and running. Okay, I had a list of stuff I was supposed to mention this morning. Supposed to, I mean, a, li a list of topics that, uh, that were sort of going to come up. Let me finish this corner here and have a look at it. There were a few things, one, I don't remember what it was, but something I was supposed to. The girls, I don't know, what Nabi-san, Ayama-san, I think they said, you should be talking about this, don't forget to tell everybody about this news, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I remember, it's the EMS news. I don't really want to talk about it, but, 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 but. That noise, man, oh man, that noise. Ugh. Oh, tornado videos, okay. So how should we do this then? <laughs> okay, okay. So okay, let's, let's, let's take a quiet break for a second. Let's look at these videos. It wasn't tornado videos. The, the heavy winds yesterday reminded me of a, of a weather event that we had here eight years ago and that the current staff members who work in Asakusa here have never seen. So I've got two short videos. These are about one minute long each. And I believe they have sound. Let me know quickly if the sound is too loud or too soft because I can't uh, hear it myself. It's just going to broadcast out there. These are from September in 2014, and we had just come to Asakusa about two weeks before this. Here's a little video shot on a tiny little camera. And this is our street. The police have jumped into action. That's our shop. The jeweler is still downstairs. And the hotel across the street the policeman is concerned about this because the hotel is built with the first floor below ground level. And the hotel had opened just about one year before this. And the cafe also next door is below ground level. And that's the shop we're at. We were doing our construction upstairs at that time. That's one of them. And then here is the second one. I'm sorry, I just grabbed my phone and swiveled it just a second. Here we go. And these are guests <laughs> coming. They've come to Osaka to stay in a hotel. And here they are coming out of their hotel. I'm sorry, very, very rough, very quick video. And at this point, the water was still coming up, and Dave here put the camera away and had to run back, and we started to get some blocking ready <coughs> and sandbagging at the front of the shop. And later on, when you look at the map of this area, you realize that the place where we have the hotel across the street, the Richmond Hotel, is built on what used to be what's called Hyotan Ike, the gourd-shaped lake. And one block from here was the lowest point in Taito Ward, and there was a big lake just one block north of here. So Mokohankan is built at absolutely, what, what do you call it, ground zero. We are at the lowest part of this whole area. And when you walk towards Sensoji from here, you are actually walking a little bit uphill. And then past Sensoji, you go downhill again towards the river. They built Sensoji on the higher part of land here, obviously. <coughs> but coming from Sensoji West, it goes down, down, down. <coughs> and this was a swamp before it became a city. And we are at the worst 
part of it. <laughs> so we, when we built the first floor here, after seeing that experience, seeing those videos, when it came time for me a few years later to claim the first floor and build it, we have built stuff here. There's no prints on the floor. There's just empty cardboard boxes. We store nothing on the ground floor here that isn't, you know, a meter or so off the ground. So we may lose our flooring if there's another high event like that tomorrow or any day soon, but I don't think we'll be losing any prints. Who knows? And then of course you look at that and you read about global warming and where we're going. No idea, no idea, no idea, no idea. Tokyo, sea level city. I don't think I'll be buying this place. Okay, again we have here, in the original there's a bunch of sweeping lines that show the shape of the boat. There's one, two, three, four, five. I don't think I can get five in here. We'll just do some, a couple maybe.
that's going to get old pretty fast actually. Okay, Vivid KP's reminding me of the stuff I'm supposed to talk about but don't want to, whatever. It's news that has to go out, whatever. Let's just do this. <clears throat> it's been cooking for a while. It's about the web shop and stuff like this. I know starting in June, we got body slammed by the post office. The Japanese post office here has been in chaos since the pandemic. There's no other word to describe it. They're still, at the moment, not accepting packages for the U.S. except for the high-cost EMS service. There's no small packet, no e-packet, no registered packets for the U.S. Japan and the U.S., all the stuff that goes back and forth, Japanese post office is still struggling with how to handle this. They're, they're incompetent. Anyway, Japanese, Japanese post office has hit us with a massive, massive price increase. They said tentative. It's not tentative. It starts this 1st of June. There's nothing tentative about it at all. It's extra charges for all EMS and international parcels for the countries that they're taking them to. And they have basically doubled the cost. We used to be able to send an EMS package to America for about 2,500 yen. That's, for example, if you bought a Great Wave or if you bought a, a Shin Hunger Print or something like that. And now the zone here, the zone to the US, they established a new zone for it. And for a kilogram, I know our Great Wave, once you put in a strong, sturdy box, the Great Wave ends up about being 900 yen. It's now 5,300 yen to send a single print EMS to America. When they accept it, it's staggering. This has led us running. We got these pamphlets some months ago. They didn't just announce this last week. They announced this months ago. So we, of course, instantly went running to our FedEx agent, and we wrestled again with UPS and DHL. Those of you who've been following these stories for a long time, you know about this. DHL told us we're not accepting new clients in Japan at the moment. They're just servicing their regular clients. A UPS said, sorry, we don't take artworks. Your stuff is considered art. If you're an international gallery moving stuff, call us for a quote, you know, to move <laughs> exhibition material around. Other than that, we don't do artworks. We won't take your stuff. We tried to send it as printed matter, which is what it is. The clerk just said, give me a break. Try again later, guy, <laughs> whatever. But we took this thing over there, waved it in their eye, and said, we have some business for you. Long story short, we are now up and running with FedEx and DHL and UPS in, in combination with the, the Japanese post office. Me and uh, Watanabe-san and Okayama, Okamura-san and Aoyama-san have spent hours, days, weeks over the past few weeks trying to thread the needle on getting these shipping costs organized. We've done it. We've changed it. All the website went live the other day with the new shipping costs, and I haven't received any angry emails yet because people, I guess, just accept it. But the bad news is all of our shipping costs right across the board have now increased everything. It went live June the 1st. And all we've done is the shipping costs that you see on the cart now, they reflect exactly what we are having to pay to, to these four companies, the post office, the FedEx, UPS, and DHL. And it depends country by country. Uh, DHL is cheaper for Europe, which makes sense because they're owned by the German post office. UPS is cheaper for America, which sort of makes sense because they are actually an American company. So there's lots of twists and turns in it. But there it is. All of our postage costs have substantially increased. People who are getting subscriptions, you will remain the same. We are not retroactively increasing any prices. If you signed up for a subscription before this happened, your postage charges will not change because we promised price protection for all subscriptions. And we'll stick by that. It's OK. So if you've got a subscription, don't panic that next month your bill is going to be higher than normal. It's not going to change. But starting now, June 1st, all new orders will be applied at the new, the new rates.
and they're not all double. I gave you the worst case there. The, the EMS for America has almost exactly doubled. Everything else is not double across the board. That was just the worst case. The other thing to mention that really makes this worse is that the EMS service came with insurance. If somebody bought a $1,000 print, when we shipped it, we paid extra at the window and we got a thousand dollars worth of insurance. And we did have some examples over the years when the post office did actually pay out on an insurance claim that I made. So it is a real thing. FedEx, DHL, UPS don't actually talk much about insurance. When you read the fine print, it turns out that they basically don't have much. When we give a package to one of these characters, carriers. At the moment we let go of the package here and the post office picks it up or the FedEx guy picks it up, our legal obligation actually ends at that point. That thing has now been turned over to the carrier. If it gets lost and gone, it's actually not even anything to do with me anymore. That's between the customer and the carrier. This is how the legal background works. In real life what happens is the customer says, where's my package? And I say, we shipped it, we gave it to a carrier. And the customer says, I didn't get it. And he comes to me for redress. But legally, actually, legally, I can tell him, blow it away. It's your problem. You talk to FedEx. Now, we don't do that, of course. We can't. In the contemporary environment, no shop can do it that way. So we're the ones who have to start handling the insurance claim. We made one last year with FedEx. And they just laughed at us. They just laughed. I mean, whatever, they didn't laugh, but you get my point. They just laughed at us. For one thing, they weren't sending us the bills until two months after we sent the shipment. We were thinking, wow, we don't have to pay for two months. That's kind of cool. Saves us money. Turned out that you have to make an insurance claim within whatever it is, six weeks of getting your invoice, <laughs> of just making the shipment. But without the invoice, you can't make the claim. So they were playing a game here. We tried to make the insurance claim on one of these a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. And sorry, guy, I know whatever, it's already past the time limit. And like, we haven't even got the invoice from you yet. So we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So they finally bent over backwards and said, okay, okay, send us the claim. We sent the claim. It was a package that had been really, maybe the guy just threw it out of the airplane onto the tarmac or something. I don't know. It was totally crunched in inside shipping. Did they pay? No. They sent us, and this is no exaggeration, they sent us, was it 35, 40, 40 page PDF manual on how packages should be wrapped for proper delivery, safe delivery by FedEx. And this is like a 40, 35 page PDF manual. And in there, there's stuff like this. When you've got your box, the thing that you're sending inside the box cannot come closer than 10 centimeters to the inside surface of the box. So if you've got a, a thing that you're sending this big, your box has to be 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. And that's got to be filled with the proper stuff that will absorb this and that, this and that, this and that. Now neither we nor any other shipper on the surface of this planet is packing stuff, you know, woodblock print, <laughs> with, with 10 centimeters of space all the way around. So the, the, the agent just says, sorry, if you did it according to the manual, we talk about insurance claim. But uh, if you're not packing according to our manuals, Sorry, we, uh, you know, we can't help you. So insurance. EMS used to pay. These other carriers are not paying. So we're paying much higher levels of freight now, and we're getting now basically no insurance on this. Wonderful. 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 Welcome to the world of making products and shipping them around the planet. Anyway, am I in a grumpy mood again? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> just I had to tell you this stuff, whatever. We were thinking, just don't tell anybody. Just let the prices go up and don't talk about it. People in the shopping cart might think, kind of expensive, but whatever. So I don't know. Yeah, this is interesting. You've been told that only the sender can make a claim. This is really, really, it, this, it's the catch-22. Absolutely the catch-22. The... The sender can make the claim, 
but it's the, the sender actually has no longer any legal liability. There's, there's, I forget the legal phrase. In international law, there's something about this. I forget the carrier. I don't know the, the phraseology. When you hand it over to one of these, you know, authorized carriers, the post office, FDL, FD, uh, I don't know, FedEx or whatever, at that point, that's where your liability ends legally, but uh, whatever. Did I notice any changes when Japan Post was privatized in 2007? I can't give you chapter and verse here, but the two examples, the Japanese post office privatization and the Japanese railroad company privatization, both did indeed have dramatic influences on both of those companies. The number and quality and variety of services exploded exponentially. What had previously been sclerotic government bureaucratic agencies turned into, quote, companies in a marketplace. And they had to get nimble, they had to get common sense, they cut billions, billions, they cut thousands of people, whatever, and they dramatically increased the service offerings. So again, I can't quote you, this happened after privatization, just I know from, the, from, from my experience living here, those two events, mostly the train one, but also the post office one. As I said, the variety of services on offer and the service level when you dealt with the people dramatically increased. We go to our local post office now, those people are friendly, they chat with us, there's nothing bureaucratic about them whatsoever. They're hip, good young people enjoying their job and trying to help us figure out the way through the maze of all their ridiculous offerings. Complicated still, yes, but they're with it. So I have no problems at all with the idea of privatizing, of privatizing those things. You know. Contra sounds asking, whatever, some sort of Pacific, Pacific Shipping Consortium thing ending. There's the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific, mm, what does it stand for? Those are, those are related to duties and tariffs and stuff. They're not, as far as I understand, related to shipping rates. America didn't join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, whatever, but now other countries have put together similar packages. I'm not, I don't really know the details on this, but I don't think that's related to what we're seeing right now. I don't know, I don't know. But you, you what happened, the US was the country that instigated this. During the Trump era, the US did something that they should have done a long time ago. It, we all have this image that Trump, blah, Trump bad, Trump bad, blah, blah, blah. But actually during that era, America, under his leadership or whatever, did do something. They uh, no, renegotiated the postage, international postage rates between America and other countries. And we talked about this too many times before, so I'm not going to go over the whole thing. It turned out that in the post-war period, America really helped the Asian economies by keeping the exchange, postal exchange fees low. You could ship things from Japan or China or Korea to America cheaper than you could ship them from America the other way. Normally, most countries keep these things in balance. Postage rates are sort of balanced. Uh, 100 kilograms to France or 100 kilograms back to America. You send me yours, we'll send you ours. They'll balance out. America specifically artificially kept the Asian stuff low in the post-war period. And we know why, to help the, the Asian economies grow and they never changed over the years. So when the, the Trump era people were renegotiating this, they were doing something that should have been done years and years and years ago, re-rationalizing uh, things like international postage rates between Asia and America. So we had had a free ride for many, 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 many years, and the American postage rates, I mean the rates to send from here to America now, are more rational and uh, respective of real costs. So I can't actually bitch you about that one. And that happened a couple of years back. It's under the auspices of what they call the Universal Postal Union. And th that organization negotiates rates between countries.
someone in the chat there, they're pointing out that we shouldn't complain too much about the shipping costs because, you know, logistics has a price. I mean, these companies obviously are, are doing a, a service. They are carrying these goods all around the world safely and quickly, something that we can't do ourselves. So, of course, I mean, we expect, fully expect to pay for the, for the service that they're offering. So nobody's expecting shipping to be free or things like this. And I guess, too, on top of that, when there's, you know, pandemics and wars, these companies do have, you know, stunning levels of uh, expense and, and problems, of course. So I'm not in any way you know, asking for a free ride here. We, of course, uh, expect to pay for the, the service we, we are purchasing. I guess the, the reason it's a bit difficult for me sometimes is because the, the changes happen. It's, it's the punctuated equilibrium sort of thing. Nothing happens for many, many years, and you build a stable business based on the way things are. And then all of a sudden, bang, something changes really, really, really strongly and heavily. So be it, you know. Again, I'm not, I'm not in a super bad mood here. I'm not complaining. I'm a bit frustrated by trying to manage these problems, of course. And then every now and then, you, your newspaper has a story about the FedEx and uh, the, the profit levels. I, I don't know the numbers. There was a story three or four months ago. The profits for the first quarter, record levels, $3 billion per share. I don't even know what the numbers were. I don't know what it was. And this came to us just after FedEx had sent us a sob story letter because of the pandemic, because of Ukraine, because of Russia. We are sorry, but we are really going to have to, again, we're going to have to boost our surcharges by another 7.5%. And they send me this letter, and then the day later in the newspaper, I read this thing about record profits, FedEx executives bathing in champagne, you know, whatever. <laughs> Show and tell coming up. Yes, yeah, someone's got a good point about that post office pamphlet. This is probably a mistranslation, actually. Who's this? Is this Contar pointing that out? I didn't, I didn't think about that, but perhaps you're right. Contar's pointing it out. They put tentative, and perhaps actually what they do really mean is temporary, for sure. Well, I don't see anything tentative about it in the Japanese name, so. <laughs> it's probably a mistranslation, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you said it long ago. Okay, perhaps I didn't see it. Sorry, I can't see all the chat here. Go man, go man. Chocolate eggs to those who deserve chocolate eggs. <laughs> it's all right. It's the other one now starting to concern me is the, the Ukraine-Russia situation. It's starting now to sort of look like they're digging in for the long term. You know, I mean, it's not starting to look like it. There's a hundred days have passed now, and at some point, some time ago, the Ukraine war looked like it might be kind of short, sharp, and simple, and we could get back. To, we, the rest of us, could get back to normal life. But obviously, that's now not going to be the way this is going to go. So uh, Dave here is sitting on this. You know, the Japanese airlines don't fly over Russia. And this is why we're having such a difficult time getting packages to Europe. And the Ukraine situation now, you tell me, your guess is as good as mine, you know. Are we looking at the First World War trench warfare? They're going to set in line, you've got that part, I've got this part, and the war is going to go on for years? I have no idea. It's been more than three months now, and there's been certainly no, not even remotely any end in sight. just want to sit here making woodblock prints, you know. I know I shouldn't be naive about this, but I just want to sit here with my friends 
making nice woodblock prints and sending them out so people can enjoy them. That's sort of all we want to do. We don't want to do geopolitics. We know we have to do business. We have to take care of business. We understand that. We have to take care of our training. We have to produce interesting products. We've got to do our part of it. We just want to make nice prints. Oh, the back of the water is fairly square. Let's do that. Someone's asking any ninja news. They're still up and running. I think they're setting up this morning. You can see them out there. They have had uh, they've had uh, a bit of a personnel change. The little the little theater act that they do out on the street a half a dozen times a day. It's still the same uh, theater act, but the the personnel's changed. It used to be the the Tencho San, the, the 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 owner of the place used to play the bad man. He would just sit in his office all day long, and when it comes time for the theater, he quickly puts the uniform on, runs down, he plays the bad man, does the thing, went back up into his office. We're not seeing him anymore. The new bad man in the act is one of the two young boys who was doing the ninja part before. So he's graduated from ninja now, and he's playing the bad man in this scenario. And there's a new person, I can't tell he's all wrapped up in black, he or she, whatever. There's a new person in the ninja staff from there. And it's funny, the kid now, he must have been, he's played the ninja part of this for the past half year while they're doing this, and he is now graduated to being the bad man. And he is overacting to a degree you've got to see to believe. <laughs> I can't video this because there's little kids there, you know, you can't sit there with the video camera taking shots of little kids and then putting it up on the internet the next morning. I can't do this, I can't show you this stuff. But it is, well, isn't it funny, it was kind of funny the first time we heard it, but he overacts. He chews so much scenery that it's hard to believe the building is still left. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> whatever. You're going to be here in a while. Some of you will be here. It's going to be opening up. <laughs> so whatever, you'll see it. The kids are loving it. And they're mostly dealing with preschool kids. They're talking, th we're talking three, four, five years old. And yesterday, there was a bunch of them. They were all little girls. It must have been some mother's group who had had little girls. And they came in three at a time, three at a time, four, and then three at a time. And they did this thing like clockwork, another hour, another hour, another hour. 
And you, you haven't lived until you've seen these two boys, one's dressed as a bad man, shouting and screaming, and they shout at the top of their lungs, you, but I can't do my own, in Japanese, like, like a super TV gekijo thing, you know. And these three little, little girls, they're three years old, they've got their little plastic swords, they're huddled, their mom is there with the camera taking pictures, so they sort of know it's okay, but these men are screaming, and every now and then one of the kids, it's too much, and they break down, start crying. <laughs> and then at the moment when the ninja power gets released, the guy, the little guy, he's saying, okay, let's do our, let's throw our magic signals at this bad guy. The bad guy's coming closer and closer, he's got his knife raised, he's coming closer. And the staff members talking to these three little girls, quick, quick, let's throw our magic symbols, you know, and they do the thing that they've practiced. I can't do this, whatever. Hand signal, hand signal, hand signal, rah! And the guy comes closer. He says, again, again, stronger. Hand signal, hand signal, hand signal, rah! Louder, rah! And that's the point where the bad guy staggers back. He's been struck by these, this ninja power, <laughs> and he staggers back. And the ninja guy says, go for it. And the three, four little girls, they grab their plastic swords and they hack this guy to death. <laughs> it is so much fun to watch, you know. And people who are walking down the street, they've never seen, they don't even know what's going on. You know, when you're walking down the street somewhere, anywhere, when you hear somebody shouting, you've like, oh my God, what's going on? And your first reaction is to keep away, like, has the man got a gun? What's going on? If there's somebody shouting and screaming, you, you keep away from it. And what happens here? These two guys start shouting, and they're using old language, like from an old TV program or something. So everybody soon gets the idea, this is nothing dangerous, and the people stand watching. So you, after a few minutes, you've got a kind of a, a crowd forming a semicircle, and inside the semicircle, there's the bad guy and the good guy, and then these three little tiny girls with their swords. <laughs> <laughs> and they do a coda to it. After the little girls have hacked him up and they've caught the guy and he's standing there with his hands like tied together, they do the same thing every time. The bad guy looks at the three, through the little kids and he points over their heads and says, look over there. And of course, the little kids, they all do exactly the same thing. They turn around and look over there. And the guy starts running down the street <laughs> in the opposite direction. <laughs> and then the good guy who's taking this says, after him, don't let him get away. And the three little kids start running down the sidewalk. They push away all the people that are in the way, and they've got their swords. <laughs> I really wish I could film this and put it on for you, but no can do. No can do. <laughs> it's good fun. It gets kind of enough after a while, but it's good fun. So, okay, let's look at some Chantel. Let's look at these match label prints. This is auction stuff. Matt Brown, he, his prints are coming up. Matt Brown can wait a day. It's okay. He's waited for 22 years since I got those prints in that folder. He can wait another couple of days. Okay, so what we've got here, there's good news and bad news to tell you about this stuff. You know, remember I showed you a while back an album, a thick, fat album of matchable prints. Somebody had scored an old album, put it up on the Yahoo auctions, and I bid against other people. I paid, I forget, 400 bucks or something, and, and bought it. This auction dealer has got the same thing. He's got an old album, and what he has done, you can see what's happening, he has chopped it up page by page, page by page, and he's putting every single page up on these auctions separately. And he's also done it so that the auction finishes at three o'clock in the morning. And there's no sniping on Yahoo. So whatever. Over the past week or so, I got a bunch of these, and once it had built up to about seven or so, I paid him for them, and he sent them, and here they are. And tonight, there's more of them coming up. Just, wow. Grumpy, 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 grumpy. Let's have a look at some of what's in here. Junk and treasures, who knows? Junk and treasures. How are they taped together here? Oh, here. Well, they're all, oh, look at this, okay. He's taped them all together. So let's just go through. 
I don't really remember what's in here because when I'm buying something like this, I know we want these. He started them all at a low price. I think they're 10 bucks per page he's put up, something like that, which is more than I would have paid if we had bought the whole thing as an album. And he's trying to maximize his money at the expense of time and trouble for all the people who want to buy these things. So let's do this. Let's have a look one by one by one. <clears throat> these are all match labels from a similar era. These are from the early Showa period. I, when we find one with a date, we'll learn more information. Until we find a date, let me just guess Showa 8, 9, or 10 for these. Oh, and it looks like we might have a Zodiac set here based on old money, do we? Or no connection with a Zodiac. No, perhaps no connection with the Zodiac. Obviously, they're based on old money here. I'm not sure what we're looking at. I'm not sure. They could be actually replications of older types of coins that were in circulation or the guys in the group have just made up an idea that's used something that looks like old coins. Whether these are actual replicas of coins, I'm sorry, I have no specialist knowledge that would tell me this at all. It could be just playing around with the idea, or it could be a replica of old money. This is the type of coin that used to be called a koban, and these are, of course, more traditional coins that had holes in them. So I was thinking at first it might be a zodiac, but I don't see animals replicated everywhere else, nor do I see the kanji for other animals. So I don't think this is zodiac. Anyway, let's move on. Some of these are going to be interesting. Some of these are going to be less interesting. Let's have a look. Someone saying, I know, okay, let's get some information here. Washabinsky, we have an old coin collection, are we? Is this the, char the characters for old coins then? How do we pronounce this? This is old, and this would be a uh, coin, and this would be shoe collection. Ko, I'm guessing, kin, ko something shoe. And this is Dainikai, it's the number two. So they've done this before. Okay, let's actually dig into this. And instead of acting dumb here, let's get some information. This is, it says, the second Dainikai ko old coin collection. So yes, thanks to Washubinsky here, we do have Ko Senshu, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. That one's way over my pay grade. Sen, Ko Senshu, old coin collection. Once we get these online then in our own collection, we will be able to crowdsource this and find out what they are actually replicas of. Thank you very much. And first guess too, I think we've got Chinese stuff mixed in here too, you know, I don't know. Anyway, let's pass it on. More information will come as we get it. The next one is nothing so uh, eclectic. Are you ready for this? And now for something completely different. They are certainly of the era. This is the way characters and children's characters were drawn back in that era. And we have no title page. We have no other information. We have a designer's name. That's all. So we are on our own here. Your guess is as good as mine. Whether they're supposed to represent real children or some kind of comic characters, I don't know. They could be famous characters from comics of the era, something like this. Something that would be recognizable to people who know these things. To me, it just looks like something generic from that era. This was a different album, what this guy had, you know. I've never seen Match Label Prints. Everything that we've got from this guy's album, with no exceptions, has been Match Labels that I have never seen anywhere else. And I'm really a bit curious about this, because every single one that this guy has, I have never seen examples of it anywhere else. 
and they're actually not really well made. The carving is not so nice. Most of them have a very low color count. And I've never, ever seen other examples of them. So I'm really, this is one reason why we're grabbing these things, even though he's asking a bit of a high price for them. I'm trying to figure out what on earth these things are and where they came from. They're quite poorly carved, quite poorly printed. These are not your prime, wonderful Japanese match label prints. I'm not sure what on earth we're looking at there. Is that a toilet seat? What am I looking at? They're certainly from the same era. Everything about them, the paper and the, the manufacturer style, seems to come from that same era. But these are all, as far as we can tell so far, these are unique. Now, these are not Chinese, these are Japanese, absolutely. Although again, this might be the part of the, the era when Japan has colonized different places. This looks does not look Japanese at all. We have Japanese flags and the Japanese naval flag. This man looks Korean, of course. The hat he's wearing is a Korean clothing which would indicate this is that same era that we talked about. This is early Showa period when Japan had colonized Korea, had taken over Korea. So perhaps, and I'm just an idea here again, this also looks Korean. So perhaps this is a set of match label prints made in Korea on the Japanese patterns and Japanese traditions. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm open to lots of interpretations here. This is new to us. I have never, ever, ever seen these before. Well, climbing a ladder. Is that what somebody's got here? Is that what this person's doing? Is that a ladder in the background? And you can see a... Climbing a ladder. I see the ladder now that you mention it, but I don't know if I see the rest of the shape here. Someone says it's the back of a hat of a person climbing a ladder. Or a hat that's hung down onto his back. I don't know. No idea. Now this next group is different. This next group really is completely Japanese and looks Japanese. And the paper is different. This is now a traditional, in every sense, a traditional Japanese match label design. And we have a set of 12, and they're labeled with months. We have here Ichigatsu and Nigatsu. We have a set of prints based on the months. So nothing foreign or Korean or anything about these. These are a traditional Japanese set. And the names we see here are the names we're familiar. Some of these names are familiar to me. These are the names of the Japanese men who were members of a match label group who would have sponsored these. So this group is known and this group is familiar. We're down to September and there's a third page here, October. November and December. All very simple, simplified. The next set again, the next set, totally Japanese match labels. Yes. We have a set, okay, I need some help again with this kanji here, just a minute. Some of this we can read. This is something Zukushi, uh, uh, an arrangement or selection of, of this, and I can't read that character, I'm sorry. Oshabinsky, something Zukushi. Any idea what this might be? I haven't a clue, I'm sorry. That is highly, highly stylized. And we have a date. We have Showa 6, August. So this is Showa 6, 
this is the same era we were talking about, all these, I think it might be Mizil, I, I really don't know, looking at the theme then, okay, that might make sense, because yeah, everything does seem to have things related to water, I would never have picked that, but okay, yes, thank you very much. We have nine of them. There would normally be a set of 12. There's nine here. Mizutsukushi. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. We have a bit of Nuno Mezuri here. Do you see it? The pattern? The embossed pattern. I guess that's a pump, is it? You fill it with water and you can pump the handle and it shoots it out. Is this for gardening? This would seem to be for gardening. I don't know what this is for. Or maybe this is on a, a part of the fire defense stuff. That could be. That could be the kind of pump that the fire department might use in the old days before they had real pumps in here. Yeah, they put a very faint Nuno Mezuri on top of every print. They would do it at the end on top of everything. This is not rice, this is ice. This is the symbol for ice. And what you have here is the Japanese summer treat called kakigori, shaved ice with flavoring poured on top. These days they pour on like syrup or cherry syrup or strawberry, stuff like that. Not rice, this is ice. Not ice cream, it's just shaved ice, kaki gori. Hmm, maybe a tub of cold water with cups for you to help yourself. Somebody has put this outside somewhere here, so. Is this, what is it? Hori do this is Iido -E as well. This looks like one of the characters for Hori digging. And this is an uh, Kiyomizu, clean water. Shimizu pronunciation or Kiyomizu in this case. And I think this is Doug, the Doug Well Clean Water, water from a local well. This will be if somebody has placed this Kakigori. I don't think it's shrine water. There's no specific thing about the shrine here. This simply says, it said, the sign says, well water. How did they make shaved ice back in those days? I have no idea. These days they've got a little machine. You hear them all over the place. The guys next door do it. They get a block of ice, and the thing goes at the bottom round and round and round, and it's got a plane blade that slices from the bottom of this thing. And in the old days they had planes, so yeah, why not? Two more sheets here. We're okay for time? Two more sheets. We're past time, but we can just look at these. Oh, look at this. We've got a big, big sheet here. We've got another date. This one is Regional Folk Toys, and I think I may have this set upstairs already. If we do have this upstairs already, then this one's going to go to Watanabe-san. This is Showa 9, one year later than the one I just showed you. And this is Nenga, Nenga large omocha shoe, the, the, the large, uh, I don't mean collection of large toys, a big collection of toys for the new year. And there, a lot of them are marked, actually, Nenga. This, that's the phrase you would see on a new year card. These all look pretty much the same. So these are traditional folk toys. folk toys, folk dolls. This one's famous, I forget where they're from. I don't know, all of these will be from a, a different region. People who know these things will know. They're their name, this, this is Yamagata. Something mountain, I don't know where they are. They're kind of cute.
Yeah, they're not supposed to be realistic animals. These are all ceramic little s traditional, traditional toys. I think we have a cat here. They're not in any way intended to be realistic. No, of course not. That's a nice little collection. I've got some of those, but I don't have all of them. So we'll have a look. So there may be some of these coming to the flea market near you sometime soon. Who knows? One last one. Let's have a look. And it looks, again, children-related. This one looks like children's toys. Let's have a look. No, just one page. Twelve of them in a set. Again, sets of twelve were really common for these things. I don't see a title page. I don't see a date. We have kids' toys. And some of them, this one you know, the standard shuttlecock and battle door. This one, you know how this works, right? I think there's modern toys that do the same way. You stack, 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 and you're supposed to knock something out without tipping over the whole thing. There's your hammer. You stack them up, you put your dadama on top, and then take your hammer and out she goes. This is a spinner, it's got a colored pattern on it, and you spin it and stand it on this stick, or maybe the stick is used to actually spin it. Game board with tops. We all know what this one is. What are these, hacky sack? I don't know. Not sure, small little hacky sacks maybe. We have two. Coma, a top, we all know what that is. They're common in the West as well. I've never seen this before, but I think we can see how it works. It's a little game, you've got rings and uh, spikes. Obviously you sit across the room and throw them in. And this one, oh, I think I know what this is, I think. See the little stick on there? I think that's a bamboo spring. And I think you, and that ball pops up and you have to catch it. We had something like this when I was a little kid. It was a little plastic basket thing with a handle and a spring at the bottom and you cock it and then pop it. The ball shoots out and you have to run around and catch it. Right? I don't know what the name is. And this one's obvious again too. That, that's, I think, in Britain, British children play with something like this. Is it an air bopper? Was it air or a spring or something? I don't remember. I think the ball was very light, something like a, a little styrofoam ball or something. Okay, these last few groups, this one, this one, and the kids in the water, these are clearly Japanese era match labels. These earlier ones, I have no idea. These are very different from anything else I've seen before. Clumsy carving, clumsy printing, Korean theme, maybe they were made in Japan's colony at the time. Is that the word we're not supposed to use, of course, but uh, my guess is that's where they come from more information as we learn it after these go into our online catalog. Okay, that'll do us. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you for the help. Washibinski, thank you very much for the characters that I myself can't read. I should maybe get this organized, send it to you in advance so you can <laughs> tell me what they <laughs> before I open it. Can't do that. They didn't open it. Okay, okay, okay. It's weekend now, and for me, that doesn't make any difference. We're going to be busy, busy, busy. I'll be back here again two days from now, and you know exactly what I'll be doing. I will be carving that same piece of wood. And once that's done, it'll be time to move on to color blocks. Okay, there we go. Thanks very much. Just sign off quietly here. Nothing much going on yet, although it's going to be very, very busy later this afternoon. Okay, see you next time, two days from now. Thanks again, and bye for now.